John Rob here interviewing uh, Ginger Wildhearts about the great new Wildhearts album. So Ginger, uh, I'm really enjoying the album. I think it's great. It's really diverse, quite experimental parts, but also super melodic, super anthemic and all the great things that everyone loves about the Wildhearts. So was a like a conscious effort to really push, push what the wild arts are musically with this record. Yeah, the, the always is. I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not one for complacency. So when the last album that we did, which was kind of the return to the to the free after about 10 years uh, since the, the album before that, um, it, 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 it got universally praised as this kind of exciting album. The songs were short and digestible and and the whole thing came off as like a, a you know a bit of a, a, a you know not not a best of but a but a package a pro, an easily digestible package which is what the rock world love well that's a red flag to be for a start so the next one I just thought well let's do something that they're not going to expect um, and and it also for a, for a writer who's been doing it for as long as me the hardest thing in the world is to streamline everything and decide on that's going to be the song and it's going to stay in that tempo. Mm -hmm. Easiest thing for me, being a Cardiac fan and a, and a Frank Zappa fan, is just changing every few minutes or every few seconds as it, as it sometimes is. Um, and it keeps it fresh, keeps it exciting for me and it keeps the critics on the toes so they don't get too kind of like, you know, a lot of people review things without really listening to them. It's a bit like when people review gigs and they and they put all the songs that you must have played but you didn't play that night. And you're like, you didn't even watch. So it's almost like a you know Van Halen and the Brown M and M's thing, just to make sure that people are paying attention. If people go like, "Oh yeah, classic Wild Hearts, Sucker Punch, Cafe Bomb," I'm like, "You haven't heard it, have you?" It's it's not that. Well, yeah, there is there is obviously elements of of uh, what we do, just because we've been doing it for so long, and I know what we don't do very well, mm -hmm. and so I, I tend to keep those ideas for for other projects um, and and me solo stuff. And then just give the wild arts the more bombastic stuff that I know we kind of, you know, love and, and chomp on. Yeah, I mean, of course, there's a lot of it is very bombastic, very anthemic in all the great ways that rock music should be. But there's also, like as, it, as you said a minute ago, loads of really unexpected twists and turns in the songs, but not sprawling, very concise. And it actually sounds like it really should be in that song. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that, I'm glad you mentioned that it's not sprawling, because I think when people, when you describe something as having a, a few bits, they all just go up, oh, prog rock, run for the hills. Yeah. And it's and it's not. It's, it's, I've always thought the Wild Arts is a, is a very, has a very punk spirit running through it. Whatever we try and tackle, whether it's a more poppy stuff or punky stuff or the, or the heavier stuff, it's, it's got a, a kind of willfulness that enjoys going against the grain. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, I, you know, people are, are scared off with the idea of oh, it's got too many parts. Yeah, but it's still three minutes long. It's got 20 parts, but it's over in a second. You, you might even want to play it again. <laughs> um, and it's just getting people to try and, you know, listen to something with, a, you know, with their, their blinkers off or their, or their kind of critics hat off. Uh, and just say, look, it's, it's, it's still creative. Rock music can still be creative. It can still be exciting. You know, and still be inventive. It's not, you know, we're not all trying to be Black Sabbath or yeah, Led Zeppelin. But Black Sabbath were actually working within those same parameters at the time. I mean, when they made their records, they were they were kind of heavy, but also experimental, weren't they? It was oh my god. But people forget well, experimental bit and just copy the two or three tricks, don't they, over and over. It's like motorhead, you know. I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a, a, a staunch motorhead fanatic. And my little boy is into uh, extreme music. He loves uh, um, Slipknot and he loves Discharge. And I try and uh, uh, Slayer. He's really Slayer now. And I try and um, explain how uh, subversive Motorhead were when they came out and how it was like being hit across the face. Uh, you know, when you went to see them live, it was literally like being hit across the face. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it's and it's hard to to. to to put it into word, into terms, like culturally, there was so little, like Motorhead, there was so little with that. It wasn't even a punk spirit, it was just a couldn't give a fuck spirit, yeah. which is the same spirit as Sabbath had. And, you know, and culturally, yeah, that's that's as, uh, as it was as subversive as, as you know, Tom Six movies or, you know, whatever, whatever Merzbo's up to now. And it's, yeah. it, it's, but there's so, so many people copied off a specific 
part of it or a specific mm. aesthetic, it's it's hard to realize that it was it was um you know it was so culturally subversive. It wasn't just copying off Black Sabbath. I mean, what's, what's, it's interesting mentioning Motorhead. I mean, of course, I know you're a fan, and I can hear Lemmy in your voice that guttural, fantastic guttural singing, but also that sense of melody. Because I would argue that Motorhead were actually a great pop band. I mean, Lemmy, we know that Lemmy totally loved the Beatles and the Everly Brothers, and people go, "What?" But you can hear it in all the songs, the beautifully written pop songs, and you have that thing as well. I think, in in a, in a sense, if, if anybody who carried on that tradition that Lemmy was kind of working in, you've kind of picked, picked up the mantle in a way, you know. <laughs> you know what? That's twice someone said that, and uh, I'm keeping them both. Yeah, well, Lemmy was my spirit animal. I mean, he was the first <laughs> the first one when I was a kid, you know, from, from being like a, a Kiss fan, and then, you know, hearing Ramones and going, oh, it's all, it's all different now. It's like... I, Kiss have just lost whatever appeal they had, um, you know, probably about the same time as me balls dropped or something. Yeah. But then Lemmy was there, larger than life, uh, you know, from round the corner. And I mean, Motorhead, you know, you might see, you were never going to see Kiss. You might see Ramones once every few years. Motorhead played the City Hall three times a year. Yeah, yeah. You, were, you were going to see, you were going to meet Motorhead. And it was just the accessibility when I, when I finally met Lemmy and he was so approachable and mm -hmm. so unlike anyone else that I'd seen. It just, it, it, it put me in, in, mm. in, in kind of, what is that stuff? When it, onyx, is it onyx where they put the little insects in? And what it, it, it solidified me as a kind of, this is how to be, you know, to, you, be approachable, be, you know, accept everyone as being on the same level and also embrace all of your influences and don't like shy away from any of it. And I love that Motorhead uh, always, he always called them a, a rock and roll band. Now I always loved the term rock and roll. It wasn't until the Wild Arts that I was, it was a dirty, dirty term. It was like old fashioned or something. And I'm like, it's like, you know, Gibson Les Paul. It's, it's yeah, it's old, but it's still vibrant. It's still, it's still fresh and new rock and roll. Amphetamine, you know, <laughs> cars, fucking, yeah. you know. It's true that there is a really weird hang up with rock and roll and rock music, and that people do think it's a bit dirty, a bit stupid, a bit dumb. But as well, you say, initially, this, this, this little piece doing here, people don't listen, do they? You know, like with an album, the album you got now is proof that rock and roll, you can, there's still boundaries that could be pushed, there's still experiments that could be made, and there's still lots you can do with the fabric, isn't there? Yeah, and that Motorhead blueprint, that rock and roll, well, what was a modern rock and roll blueprint, because he took Elvis and he took Little Richard and he combined them with a African cement mixer. Mm. And that bludgeon approach to rock and roll is still very, very much a, a, as attractive as it'll ever be. Same as punk rock, just that kind of spirit of, you know, not having a bit of play, but just putting 100% into what you're doing, however limited it is. That that can't be allowed to die because that, that's the most exciting thing in the world. People are learning to play is boring. But I think, you know, these, the, 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 the highbrow journalists of the, of the nineties creating all of these sub genres in music and everything they, for no reason at all, really, than to make that month's run of papers um, a bit more exciting for, for students or whatever. Um, but they, but it, it, it it broke down a lot of uh, things that were great about music. The, the the inclusiveness of it. It's um, you know, it was for everyone and and not, you know, you were it, there wasn't a door policy. You know, whatever you look like, whatever your background, whatever you you know you 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 know culturally where you know whatever you stand for, it was all there. It was all open. And then there's all this there's all this kind of policies and and. I've always hated that. I've always hated any kind of judgment of any kind, but in music, it's a bit like, this is, excuse me, this is my little boy. Oh, I, I, I can edit anyway, so don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> Taylor, Taylor, I'm just doing an interview, mate. Can I call you back? We're just talking about you, actually. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll call you back in an hour. Love you. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, all these, all these subgenres and stuff in music. I think it's just a, it's, it's 
just a waste of time. It's like, you know, any critics, it's a waste of time. I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, educating myself on, on bands, especially with vinyl. And if you look at the critics, uh, you know, and listen to the albums that the critics tell you to buy, it's, it's, they're, they're awful. They're the, the most easily digest, the, most, the dumbest albums that any band released. And I'm, I'm a big fan of going on covers. Somebody's got a weird cover. I'm like, the band's going through a transitional point here. It's before they got, you know, cliched. Uh, it's, a, it's a unique, and I'll go for that one. And the, and the, the joys within in that is uh, that freedom is, is amazing. I think, you know, it's, again, uh, music should be anti-genre or, should, or it should embrace everything. And I think in the 70s, before all of these sub-genres, people did embrace everything. And that was yeah, and I, think, I, think, I think that's what you're like. And I mean, what's it, that's what interests me about what you do in the wild arts is, it's, just, it's very much a celebration of a form. It's a celebration of all the great things about rock music. But at the same time, it's also an embrace of lots of other forms and somehow it made into the three minute pop songs. I mean, that, that's what's interesting about what you're doing because there's so many bands, you know, there's a lot of bands working within what, what was ostensibly very sort of straight down the line rock and roll and they're good at it, but you, you're taking this somewhere else. And I was reading somewhere that, um, you're a big fan of the Beatles and the way the Beatles could play any style of music and always make it sound like the Beatles. In a sense, is what you're doing, but through a fuzz box. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of the Beatles, actually. Oh, well, um, I just read that somewhere. Maybe that was, yeah. Or maybe the idea, the idea that, that you, you're, not, you're not tied down by genre. You're not a thing. You can be anything you want. No. One, well, one of the bands that I do love is Sparks. I saw your oh, uh, yeah. interview with them yeah, yeah. recently. And they're one of those bands that, it, you know, you're not going to get the last album when you get the next album. They're going to be doing something new. Um, mm -hmm. And some of it you're going to like and some of it you're not going to really understand. And that, that makes me appreciate them even more that they're, they're on one and it's not for me. I'm just, you know, got me a big box of popcorn and then just enjoying <laughs> their ride. Yeah. Um, and obviously they're, they're, you know, heavily influenced by the Beatles, but they went and took that and, and did their thing with it i like i think i, I was gonna say i like bands who were inspired by the beatles but i'm not sure there's many that aren't it, indirectly or otherwise yeah um, but, I do, but yeah i do like I, I do like bands who willfully disregard the, any rule books i mean it's interesting yeah. you mentioned sparks i mean i think what you're 56 now you just you're younger than me i am yeah so so would you would glam rock actually be your initial Kind of, kind of spark, you know, the, the tail end of glam rock, 74, 75, when you're like a little nipper. No, 73 was, uh, oh, wow. yeah. my, my big thing was Sweet, um, oh, yeah. Hellraiser mm. on Top of the Pops. And, and you know, there was a um, the guitar player, um, Andy Scott, had a sticker on his guitar. I mean, I, the song came on, and it was loud and raucous, and, and it, it, it vocals surprisingly aggressive. Uh, and my parents hated it, and I, so instantly I was just like, "Oh, this is mine then." <laughs> yeah. And then the and I was already in, and then the camera zoomed into this sticker on his guitar, and it was an inverted smiley. I've actually got it over here, but I stuck to something. Um, an inverted smiley with the word "shit" on it, and I just went, <laughs> "There you go." That was my first punk rock moment, 1973, and that yeah, was I mean, in. I, I was a glam rock kid as well, and I think it was it was a great foundation for music because. Even though, again, it's another form of music that people don't take that seriously, you know. Yeah. Well, the, what people are actually doing within those formats is quite amazing. Not just David Bowie, but that run of sweet singles. Even, even the lesser bands like Mud were making incredible singles that were quite diverse um, and quite odd and quite off kilter. So it was a great musical education, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, and, and Roxy Music was in there and... Of course, you know, sparks and, <laughs> and, and sparks. You know, there was there was tons of good stuff, and then even now you hear stuff that wasn't really big, like you know the Rubettes, Sugar Baby Love, or or mm. or Sailor, Glass of Champagne. You just go like, that's like the 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 Abba blueprint. You know, Abba just took that 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 kind of baroque pop, um, mm. and and just and just you know refined it a bit more, but it was all there. And the missing link between the Beatles and ABBA was glam rock, I, th I thought, mm. because, of the, you know, there's the, the big choruses. And it's kind of like, well, yeah, someone needs to do some kind of retrospective on glam rock, because I think a lot of it was just, well, they were ugly and they didn't suit makeup, so we'll dismiss yeah. it. Right? No, no, it was just a strange time. That was yeah. anything goes. But the fact that there was makeup bands 
um, that were being sung on the terraces. So it, it culturally it broke, it broke a lot of walls down. People weren't shocked by, you know, by the, 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 you know, the, 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 the sexual um, ambigu ambiguity of it. Um, and it kind of, it's got, it, it lives in this place that kind of John Inman and Larry Grayson used to live where it was, <laughs> the families loved them. Your dad loved them, yeah, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you saw two blows kissing. Oh, not in front of me, but, <laughs> but, but light, openly effeminate, you know, things. And it's obviously anyone who loves music loves openly effeminate things because it, it's, it's again that that spirit of like fuck you, I don't care. Mm. Um, and, I, and from an early age, that was just was like, you know, I, I was just, I was I understood the language. It was just this is great. It's colourful. It, it's and it's it's wild. It's reckless. It doesn't. It, it it's not asking permission for any of this. I mean, and, uh, and I still wait for things like that now. Like punk was the closest thing, I guess. Yeah, well, when you look back, punk and glam, they do seem quite similar now. Don't they? they seem like a million years at the time, but now they sort of blur up, don't they? And it was only a few years. It, it, when it ran into it, it, I mean, the Ramones are really a glam band in a sense. The gap from the Arrows to the Ramones is pretty small. Really. <laughs> The arrows, yes. Yeah, great. what a great band, you know. I love rock and roll. A B side, yeah. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. You know, there's so, well, there's so much, so much good stuff uh, in that. It was, you know, probably don't want to go into too much about why it was like that, but it was just a great cultural shift based on how miserable things were and how how terrible politically the the, the world was, and especially in America, but mm -hmm. over here as well. Um, and and music just went. You know, yeah, hold me beer. I've got this one. Did it get you through like your youth in, in the northeast at all? This was this very key. Uh, it, it was everything. It was everything. It was that, like you say, it ran into punk rock, you know, by way of uh, Angelic Upstarts. Um, and then uh, Angelic Upstarts seemingly ran into Venom. And, and, and there was this kind of still, you know, a healthy amount of theatricality there um and you know plenty of foot stomping and, and fists in the air kind of stuff but these were these were bands that got out of the northeast they went and did things and so it was um music was it was music of football basically wasn't it and occasionally yeah. acting but music of football was the only that, things that I remember started a massive musical genre by mistake don't they so it's, what's that <laughs> well black metal comes out of venom doesn't it so it's like they start unintentionally start a whole other scene off about 10 years which later. is weird because they named it but they sounded fuck all like it <laughs> oh, no. the venom were just trying to do what discharge did which mm. was just you know turbocharged motorhead mm. and uh, you know and and the you know same same blueprint completely different approach but you know it was there uh, arguably the yeah, venom spawned a monster because yeah. you know a lot of the bands that called themselves black metal were Fucking dreadful. Well, oh, some of them were really good as well, though. Some of them have gone on to do completely bizarre stuff that's nothing like black metal. So they kind of got off these other kind of like Wardrooner or Over, make these amazingly mad records that aren't even rock records anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The electro, the dark wave stuff and things. What, well, a, what about what, what's what's going on now in black metal? Name, name me a good black metal. Well, Wardrooner started as in black metal. Uh, with, I think he's a drummer of Gorgoroth, but now they do Viking kind of choir music and it's amazing it's so atmospheric and all of us sound like frankie goes to hollywood but a very dark version oh my god brilliant yeah. I, I, I was i was over a couple of tracks it's pretty mind-blowing where these bands end up but they come from that point they come from that point of loving venom and and that little black metal and the little shop in oslo it's it's just kind of a weird journey i'm just gonna open the door for my dog there you go there you go down there what are you doing there <laughs> i'll open the door for you <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I've, I've, I know very little about black metal actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it was a, it was um, Watain were good. I, I, I like them. I don't know what that that, that style is. And uh, there was a, a band called Cavellatat that mixed black metal with uh, oh, amazing kind of heavy rock that. and roll. Yeah, yeah. I've, seen, that, them, I've seen them live actually a few times. They're great. Yeah, with a guy with a big owl on his head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they do. They are. They, they've actually ended up not far away from where you are. I can imagine you playing on the build together, and that would work that really, really well, wouldn't it? Ah, uh, the 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 fact that you just put a build together would work. You know, I love 
like you know we when we we just got some gigs together with uh, discharge and uh, and people are going like isn't that a bit different and I'm like what on earth is different there's five of them and there's four of us and that's the only real difference it's like you know they're playing loud music no uh, with it's definitely passion. part of their dna in the wild art sound you can you can hear it but you just you know but they, they got a very linear version of it and you've got a much more uh, not sprawling but much more complex version which is which is the trick last we talk about initially so mm -hmm. so so did you come from a musical family or was it or was it was it like a lot of us in the 70s there were no musical families really <laughs> it was just like you were into punk rock and you're just trying to make music you don't know how you do it yeah i didn't even know any musical people let alone family members hmm. um i uh I, 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 there are no musical members in my entire family tree i'm, I'm the first one ironically I've got three kids and all three of them are really musical and they're not like doing it to, you know, to impress me or, or because I've drummed it into them. They've just naturally gravitated towards making music and, and all three of them are very, very um, good at it in different ways. But there was no one. Um, I, I remember just being constantly told like, well, what, you know, at school, what you're really going to do. And I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to make an, an album. I'm going to come back and I'm going to, I'm going to sign it and put it in your desk. Yeah, I couldn't be bothered when I finally got around to making one. <laughs> but there was there was no one. I didn't even know anyone. Um, I mean, apart from hearing about people like Venom and Angelic Upstarts, I didn't personally know anyone who'd moved out of the northeast and yeah. moved to to that London. Yeah, well, apart from Brian Ferry as well, I guess. But yeah, uh, Brian Ferry and well, Snake, not many. No, we could you know you can name them in about a minute, can't you? It's not like Manchester or whatever. It's God so no. We, were you quite an arty kid then? Were you the sort of kid who was into arts and stuff? Or were you, what were you like as a kid? Or were you just one of the mad kids at school? Um, well, both really. I mean, I was, um, I was, I was, I was really good at art. I was, I was really into art. It was just, a, it was a good, you know, before you learn to do anything, it's a great outlet, a creative outlet. Um, so I used to get me, you know, me anger out by, by, you know, disappearing into pictures. And then, um, and, uh, and then, and movies, of course, and then drugs. And mm. as soon as drugs came along, and and older brothers were palming, looking, um, travel sickness tablets and 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 gas, PR spray, glue, and you were just like, I'm in, I'm in this, you know. And all the all the younger brothers were all going hanging out in parks, getting high, and and then and then, punk rock. I mean, mm. that was that was really it. Was it was the attraction of drugs? I mean, I know for some people, drugs are just a way of blotting out an existence. Some for some people, it's, it's sort of artistic, sort of more sensitive types, which I'm guessing you are really. It's actually a way of like uh, trying to find a way of adding to that. It paints pictures in your head, but it ends up being very messy. But it's was it was that an appeal, or, or you were, or, or a madhead who just likes doing crazy shit? You know, like you're the sort of person to jump off a, a ten foot wall for a laugh. You know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we used to do a lot of stupid things like that, you know, hanging off bridges and see who could last the longest, and you know, going under them, you know, where the the in tree under trains where they've got like a kind of stone coffin thing that people can fix the train and going and taking the stones off and lying under there and letting the train go past you, isn't it? Until I look back and think, if any of my kids did that, <laughs> yeah. but you know, a board basically. I always had a very low boredom threshold. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was part of it. Also, I was from a very unhappy uh, domestic um, background. So anything to, to kind of, you know, escape that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also because it was it was fun and it was a little community. It was a, there was a lot of, you know, you'd hang out with people who were listening to punk and were listening to, you know, rock before, you know, pre pre metal. But you just uh, a lot of different people. And you know, again, down to the drugs. You do, you know, you do speed with the rock guys, glue with the punk guys. Um, you know, all the all the while I was, you know, the, everyone drank. And then you know, you you take that kind of, you know, alienation kind of camaraderie onto the dance floor. And there'd be certain bands that you'd all kind of gravitate towards, like Motorhead and Stiff Little Fingers. Um, so the whole thing was a kind of we're outcasts of every every type, you know. Mm. Um, and, I, and I always liked that. And then, you know, I was told that I should go and join a, um, a go to college. And I, 
I went to call him, it was me and a guy called Miser, who was this guy with a big mohawk. Um, um, and we were in the art class and there was a teacher called Morag and she had a pill badge, which is, which is the worst bit about it. She, she was a, a, claimed to be a, a, a bit of a, a post punk. And, uh, and, and she says, you know, draw that bunch of flowers. So I drew these flowers with angry faces and some of them were smiling. And, and she went, that's not that. And I went, no, no, it's, that's my uh, interpretation of that. And, she, and, yeah. I says, she, and I says, that's, that's just my style. And she went, you're too young to have a style. And I went, and you're a Public Image Limited fan. Yeah, really? that's nice. She's not really getting the, the whole Public Image thing at all there, is she? Really, <laughs> really. And, uh, and so, yeah, the Primark shopper. Um, and so I stood up and I left after one day and this guy Miser left and we both walked out of college going like, what are we going to do now? And, and then we were like, well, let's go to the pub. And I, I kind of stayed there for about three or four years, just trying to figure out what I was going to do and stuck in the Northeast, um, working shitty jobs and, and listening to John Peel and watching the old grey whistle test. And there was a band called Jason and the Scorchers on the old grey whistle test. I was working in a pizza, a pizza shop kitchen. Um, and, or, and Jason and the Scorchers came on the old grey whistle test and they played this song, White Lies. And it mixed punk and country, two things that I absolutely loved. And I never even thought that you could blend things like that. And I just went, that's it. You can mix genres. And I like all of these different types of music. And that was, handed me notes in and within a few days I was um, on a clipper bus with a girl I just met um, and off to London to form a band and it was that, that was the power of music was as soon as he gave me a, you know the confidence to say you can you can mix Cheap Trick and Ramones and Motorhead and Sweet I went whoa <laughs> yeah, yeah. you can and I'm going to and I yeah, that was pretty much what got me out of the Northeast was Jason and the Scorcher, by way of all these other bands, obviously. So it was always, always about getting out, getting away. Everything, get, get you know, drugs, drinking, you know, every, even sex. Just, it wasn't even a, about anything meaningful or long lasting. It was just like, just me, stop me thinking for a little bit. Mm. Is that, is that what you're like? You, is your head like a volcano, just full of thoughts? I mean, I follow your Twitter, and it does kind of zigzag around quite a lot, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. It's a fucking nightmare. It's a nightmare. <laughs> it just, I've, I've always had mental health problems um, before they were had names, you know, convenient mm. terms. Um, and, I've, you know, no doctors or medication or anything has ever really done anything, not even helped or hindered, just hasn't even worked. Nice to read, you know, a lot of uh, the Colin Wilson and um, you know the Outsider, and and try and, and, and see a correlation between being creative and being a bit fucked up in the head. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh well, at least it's uh, it didn't feel very good, but at least it's company. Yeah. Uh, and I still feel like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And even when I'm writing, my guitar is like, come on, pick me up. I've got some got some stuff here. Mm -hmm. um, and I just and I still that's the only thing that that. that calms me down, gets me out of my, out of the, out of the fucking miasma and, and allows me to live in the moment. Um, so it's always been music, even, you know, long before I was writing, but certainly as a writer, it's, I, I'm, I'm so grateful for it. And the fact that now I, I, st I get to make a living at it. Yeah. And even some of these terrible things that you, you write about, um, someone else identifies with it or and you even make some people feel better mm. you know which is like that's it's now not a hobby anymore it's something a bit more it's a you know, so something more aligned to being a, a, a reporter on the human condition so, um, so, uh, my I, I, human I imagine your head inside is like a flock of birds who are all ideas all flying around. <laughs> birds and bats and wasps and pterodactyls and all sorts of shit flying it's up a there great from image, UFOs. I could, that, that would actually make a great video, but... <laughs> <laughs> Fucking but, hell, yeah. Who the fuck would but be... When you're on a roll and it's coming down and you're writing songs and the songs are coming together and, and the ideas are coming out and leaving a bit of space, creating a sense of calm maybe. Does that, does that work? Is, that, is this how it works? It's like... It's a very positive self-medication and creativity. Um, well, the other day, uh, I, 
you know, I don't know if you if you suffer from stuff like this, but you know, if you people do have a tendency to just spiral. Something happens, and so you can't let go of it, and it just takes you on a fucking on a, on a mad ride. Um, and I, I have I've been sober for for quite a while, and just next thing I knew, I had a bottle of wine in my hand. I was just pounding this wine down to try and feel something. Um, and a and a song came, and as shit as I felt. The song is quite good. Mm. Um, doesn't always happen like that. Definitely not when you're drinking. I've, you know, I'm, not, I'm sure anyone writes any good stuff when they're drinking. <laughs> you know, you know, opposed to a popular myth that drinking drugs yes. it, it makes shit songs. It um, sounds better while you're doing it than when you feel, than the next day, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah, or the next day you just wake up and you go, ah, oh, I've just rewritten Overkill. You know what I mean? Exactly <laughs> <laughs> fucking same. But this song came out and it was one of those, it, it was another one of those instances where, you know, it's, it, sometimes it's almost like, you know, you, it's a relief. It's, it's your, it's your relief. It's your reinforcements like to get you through. It's like, okay, here's another song. And that's enough just to get you through just for that, you know, that evening, just, just to get to bedtime in order to wake up the next morning. And that's, you know, pretty much, what music does for me now um, and listening to it as well not just my own stuff but i just you know put some music on and sometimes you know i don't know it could be cocteau twins or lana del rey and you're just like oh, it's, it's di- i mean i mean ingesting this stuff i'm not hearing it mm. it's actually i'm i'm can say like osmosis yeah I don't know. It, you know you know you're, you're oh, right. completely it's the most powerful art form isn't it it's it's amazing more than and I love all, like you, I love all kinds of art, film, painting, even sculpture, whatever. But music is the one that's so powerful, isn't it? Have you always made music? Because obviously I used to go to see uh, uh, your band um, all, yeah, the, all yeah. the time. Um, yeah, all, my, all, all my life, but um, I, I haven't got the, uh, the skill like you have to make it more listenable. <laughs> yeah, but you've always been a very commanding front man, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a... What would you say, a king without a kingdom, or a? Because <laughs> you you have that knack. I mean, like probably like all people, creative. Everyone's got millions of ideas, but just it, somehow you've got a discipline to squash it into three minute pop gems. I mean, every track on that new album is a great pop song, but there's a million ideas in there. But but you don't even feel like there's a million ideas. And I'm quite fascinated. Maybe I'm just selfishly fascinated to work out how the fuck you actually managed to do that. <laughs> Yeah, it's easy. Just a restless mind and a big record collection, mm. you know. And, and it's and sometimes I, I just sit with the guitar and let it tell me what the next bit is. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, usually that's. It feels like a bit of a cheat, actually. There's a lot of times when you when you do that, you just think, well, I'm a subconsciously lifting from a bunch of stuff that I I don't have in my record collection, but I've heard in a pub or something. Mm. Um, and you think I better be careful taking credit for this, and, I, and I'll, I'll rack my brain, especially when there's a few different bits. I'll rack my brains going like, "Who's going to take me to court on this one? What's the, you know, that sounds a bit like Elvis, but he's dead. That's, you know, should be okay. That's Frank Sinatra, fifty years copyright should be okay. But then there's a lot of stuff. You, you'll release a song, and someone will say, "Oh, that's exactly like Bauhaus," and I'll be like, "I've never heard that song, or, or yeah. something even new," and I'm like, "Never even heard that band." Well, all, it's all borrowed, isn't it? I mean, the thing is that you may you probably didn't borrow it, but whatever people think you took it from, that person took it from somewhere else. It's what you do with it and how you make it. I mean, a Wild Hearts record is very much you and your like and your band and your little your little kingdom. And it, you, it's definitely discernibly obvious it's a Wild Hearts record. So that's the creativity, isn't it? They're like little vehicles to put your yourself into, aren't they? Yeah, and 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 thank God. For- for borrowing mm. every time I hear something new, and it just is like my latest obsessions. Um, uh, a girl called Beth Jeans Horton, who, who um, whose alias is Du Blonde, mm-hmm. and she's got an album called Homecoming that just every single song on there you're already friends with, you know. It, but it didn't sound it didn't sound exactly like something, it's just channeling so many great things, like many great, you know, glam and and rock you a picture show and you know just classic melodies and it's uh, yeah it yeah it te- technically is all borrowed but wrapped up in this completely unique package that 
I've yet to find anyone who doesn't fall in love with it. Mm, and, yeah. and I hope music will always borrow because it's like that's the best thing about it. It instantly has a has a connection. Yeah, I mean, with, with the wild arts, there's always people think it, 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 if people don't get it straight away, they tend to write it off. Um, and I've never if I if I do buy an album and I like it straight away, I tend to go off it. To, mm. to, you know, it's got no challenge. It's got you must be the same. Yeah, but it, and that works as well. I mean, it's, it's some music is completely brilliant to listen to twice, and it makes its impact. And that's what oh, it's yeah. there for, isn't it? I mean, that's ace, isn't it? And some music, it's a ch it takes years before you get it, doesn't it? Oh yeah, but oh, that, that feeling when you put a record on and there's just that song that's just been hiding mm -hmm. innocently in all the noise, and it just jumps out one day and just jumps on your lap and starts licking your face, <laughs> and you're like, "Where you been?" <laughs> I've heard this album a hundred times. Where you been? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you you it just got me thinking. You know, you remember them old Monty Python records where you could put the needle on and you'd get one of two sides running. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Could yeah. you still do that? I, yeah, well, I reckon you could. I think you could make that. So you, you're actually thinking of doing that for a, like a collector's item. <laughs> well, well, imagine if you did it, but it was the same album. Just one song was different. Yeah. Imagine that. I was almost that would fuck someone's head. Just every tenth play, you get this other song. Going, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> House of Leaves, where there's just an extra room all of a sudden. Um. Anyway, yeah, that's how my brain works. <laughs> yeah, no, it would actually. I can actually imagine that being done as on the next record. So yes, yeah, so, so but so in growing up in the northeast, I mean, was it was it? It's a very macho culture which is great it's quite funny you know Geordie's I don't you know it's, it's age the way where the Geordie's are and that but do you feel different from that kind of crowd was was a was there a sensitivity an artfulness which was difficult to place till music came and gave you that space and, and for your mates yeah. you know, as well and what and, and for your mate you know the sort of people you hang around with you know they, they might be completely mad psychotic kids but there was something else there but they can never you luckily you find a way of articulating it through guitar and imagine some of the people you grew up with didn't really find that, but but it was there, wasn't it? And there's just nowhere for these people to go apart from rock and roll, is it, at that time? Well, yeah, I, I used to find, um, like most people like me, you know, the the the, the waves and strays of society. Um, and and with that, enter into their madness and their kind of you know love of whatever drink or drugs or or whatever they were doing, you just kind of it, jump into it um but you know within that you've got a lot of really like intense and weird people and 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 a lot of whom kill themselves you know there seems to be like a, it's a very dark place so shields where i come from there's a lot of suicides um and and, it, and that was that was a big part of it you know so i was uh, you know the, the more that i was kind of you know buffered into shape by all these experiences the further away i was from my friends that I was supposed to be hanging out with. My friends tended to be, uh, they, they, they gravitated towards like heavy metal and they were like Iron Maiden fans and Judas Priest fans and I could never get on with that sort of music. So I was, I was vi vilified for um, having shit taste. You know? <laughs> like, you're, you're like Klaus Nomi, you're, what do you, you know? And I, I used to like things like that, Klaus Nomi, I'd be like, What's <laughs> perfect. And they were like, no, 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 it's like, listen to Scorpions. I'm like, yeah, it's so, funny. So, do you think a lot of people make that jump into music, and then the first few groups get into, they just stay there? You know that that was, yeah. that was a weird bit of their life. I'm not going anywhere else. Yeah, and, 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 people, and the, it's just an endless adventure, isn't it? And this on the same table in the same pub, you know, with the same people. <laughs> I know a lot of people who are still there, still talking about the same. Do you remember when? You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Remember when we went to see Rory Gallagher? Nothing wrong with Rory Gallagher, absolutely. But oh, um, yeah, part, I just, part of it, yeah. I, I, I was. I needed to go and have new. I'm still the same. I need. I need to go and have new, new experiences and new, you know, attach new again, patches to myself. Um, I, I don't. I don't see any. I, I'm not very zen like, so I don't see any other reason for being here other than to try and, you know, make your make your book a bit thicker. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, all great music is made by people who move like that. And, you know, it's it's not. It's a restless process. Art, the best art, is always really restless, isn't it? Really good point. Really good point. Yeah. Well, because don't they say it's not arts? 
not finished off, it's abandoned. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's a great one, isn't it? And, it, and it's that thing, isn't it? It's like, it's not like tidy. It's not like a movie. And I don't uh, think people, people, creative people's lives aren't very tidy. Not the ones I've met anyway. No, no, it's, it's, it's mad, isn't it? So yeah. but, uh, you're always working on lots of different projects, lots of different styles. And, and like you said before, you, you'll write a song that doesn't fit to Wild Hearts or come out as a different project. But what is it, what is it that works within the Wild Hearts? Does it work as a band kind of situation? Is it a very different dynamic from a lot of the other projects you do? Or do you tend to bring the same way of working with people to everything that you do? No, I, I wish. No, the Wild Hearts is a very... I, I, used to have a, I used to have a problem with the Wild Hearts because it was, it was so different than everything else. I, I think I want, when I was younger, I wanted something a bit more traditional. I wanted a, you know, a... a a, a lemmy and a fast eddy and a filthy animal mm. and, and i got and i ended up with by default a ramones you know <laughs> just just dysfunctional people trying to can get the shoes on and mm -hmm. um and and now that's that you know it's exactly the same it's almost like it's a it's a, it's, it's a very volatile kind of powder keg and we just got good at handling it you mm. know not very good at anything else but we're good at kind of knowing how far to push this one before it goes mm. up um, and it's still exactly the same. It's still, you know, it, and, and I don't mean this in a, in a hyperbolic kind of critical way, but it's still very, very volatile. Um, mm. It's completely unpredictable. Um, and that's that's what a lot of people find interesting about it. I, I, it's fucking annoying a lot of the time, but I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's family, isn't it? You know? Like, <laughs> I mean, our bands are weird setups, really, aren't they? You, you, because a long term, isn't it? Because when you're a kid, it's, it's a year, but then suddenly it's forty years, and oh my I know God. you work with lots of different people. But you know, working in those kind of situations with long stretches of time is is quite odd, isn't it? You know, it's mm. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Well, especially when you when you're a band who definitely weren't about the long game. You know, mm. we were you know, speed freaks. We were, it was literally, you know, that evening is all that matters. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then, you know, to last a year, to make a second album, you just said, whoa, what happened to us? <laughs> oh, you're getting old, I'll oh, be slippers on next. And then 30 years later, and he just like, it's ridiculous. And none of us died, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's so many friends that died who were dabblers, yeah. you know, and we were never dabblers, you know. Mm. It was it was it was complete dedication to the cause, <laughs> and we and we still we're still here, and it, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. It it feels it it feels like it's worth documenting things now because you know I've no doubt that we'll all be fucking living through COVID, and if the dude end up dropping a nuclear bomb, we'll be hanging around with the, the fucking cockroaches and the, <laughs> yeah. the rats. But we can't we can't be finished off so we might as well just keep <laughs> keep going because uh, we never stuck around because we've been invited we've always stuck around usually because we it annoys people <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. still here <laughs> yeah i mean it's, it's very few bands that you can go and see that, that look that bruised and battered on the stage oh my god it's uh, you want to see it backstage man it's just it looks like a bunch yeah. of pirates coming back from a, <laughs> from a, from a, from a scrap there's bits missing and there's bits hanging off and, and it's like there's all this you know everyone's like personalities that through years and years of of just being themselves you know anyone walking in just walk turns around and walks back out right well we thought it was going to be full of girls and bikers <laughs> like no it's a self-help group mate you know what i mean it's like, you're welcome in but it's more fun out there <laughs> this is this is another fascinating thing because as you say, it's all brute, it's, it's kind of a bit hanging off, it's very dysfunctional, but the records and the live performances are really tight. It's like at some point, the minute the pl everything's plugged in, whatever madness is going on, and whatever madness did go on years ago, and whatever uh, conflicts there are, different personalities, it becomes a really incredibly tight unit. It's one of the things I was really thinking about the new album, is everybody plays exactly fucking dead on super tight, you know, which is, again, and not all most bands don't all like that, you know. It, it does sound like a unit, like a like a military unit. Mm. It's it's all down to Ramones, mm. um, you know that being being uh, being um, informed 
by Ramones and their fan base. Because I used to go to see Ramones whenever I could. Um, I, long before I knew how dysfunctional they were as human beings, they were just this super tight, super together band with these really funny lyrics. And then you go to see them and every single freak in any town they were in were at this place. You know, like, this, this must be every one of them crammed into one room. You can't <laughs> be anymore outside. And, and where do you all go when the show's over? <laughs> Literally every different type of person. And I should just think, like, not only was is that home, and it was a, an extension of the motorhead thing. You know, you'd be, you'd be next to a, a skinhead and next to a punk, and, you know, no animosity whatsoever. You were at a motorhead gig. Um, same with the damned. Mm. Um, and, I, and, and that was to me, it was, you know, that I didn't even want to recreate that. I just never thought that I would. They were very, very special, iconic bands. But we have, we have the same thing. We have an audience made up of all different types of people. So when you do go and play, you realise that not only is this your community and you better, you better be good for them, people are paying good money here, but you're also almost, you know, dragging along this uh, this this standard mm. it's like a, you know you're, you're carrying the the bat on for all of these yeah, yeah it's like a battle rock and roll is always there and it's just different mm. bands uh represent it at a certain period of time don't they yeah and if, if anyone new comes and joins our community and and you know gets into the band however whatever age they are i want them to go there and go no matter who you are you're not going to be surprised you know no matter how out of step you are with everything outside in Civvy Street, when you get in a Wild Arts gig, it's going to feel like home. You found your you found your monkeys, you know, mm -hmm. have a good time, come back, you're welcome. And now that there's all the online community stuff as well, who are always helping each other when we're not around, when we're not really making records, we're just, a, we're a soundtrack to it, but they're always helping each other because, you know, a lot of people in our community, they, they, you know, they struggle in their own way to get through life, but there's always someone like them unlike out there in the real world where they're just uh, on an on an island of one so it's a it's a great place and it's carrying on that 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 valiant tradition of having a room full of freaks getting into a band who are playing way too loud <laughs> <laughs> and the empowerment that comes with it as well that makes you know no matter what? how the empowerment i think is great in rock and roll that no matter how dysfunctional you feel as a person when you find that space those bands that community that audience it makes you feel like you can actually do something, which happened to you when you were a teenager, that glam, then punk, made, I imagine, quite a disoriented, disorientated teenager feel they could actually do something. You know, suddenly you could, there was, there was a way in life, you, you could get, or what was inside, you could get it out and make something with it. And that's the baton, really, isn't it? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that feeling that you hope everyone finds, you know? It's um, obviously, if, you know, it's easier to find if you, if football does it for you, you know, it's a big one there, you know, and even if, you know, you've got alcohol problems, you've got Alcoholics Anonymous that'll do it for you there, and that's a big one, it's worldwide. If you're just a fucking freak, it's it's really hard to find your people. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, I, and I found them through, mainly through music. Well, I, you know, 99% through music. Mm. Um, through you know playing it, through loving it, through going to see it live, through falling on the ground in the pit, and some stranger picking you up and going like, "I'm safe." You yeah, know, yeah, wouldn't yeah. look like it to the outside world, but I'm safe here. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's that's very much a, a, a reason why we still do it with the wild hearts. You know, mm. it's a thing; it's not ours anymore. Mm. Plus the other reason is that every morning you wake up and imagine the, 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 bird, the pterodactyls and the birds and the tunes flying around your head. I mean, you have to go and write another song. The curse of creativity it doesn't switch off, does it? No, you got to you got to you got to calm them down. You know, <laughs> calm them all down. So you just go write a song, and it's it's great. It's it's great. Ironically, seen as great. Mm. But it is, it is, it's a fantastic thing. You know, if uh, if life really is, you know, one day you get to look back on hindsight and go, you know what, I get the punchline now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that would be great because it has been great, you know, and I've been given a great gift to get through any adversity and God knows there's been quite a few, quite a bit, um, and, uh, and, and, and put something out 
you know, give, give, be of service in some way, you know, as a as a as a as a mood swinging fucking weirdo. Um, I've got a good deal. Yeah, yeah. And now, as you're getting older, which is a cool thing, you know, to, to get to get past forty is a cool thing in rock and roll. Um, <laughs> Do you, do you feel different? Do you bring a different thing to this now? Do you feel like a, an elder statesman? Is there a wisdom you get from years on the road and being creative? No, no it doesn't feel like it. You, you, you can see it in younger bands who, you know, say they've been listening to you, um, the, the parents or the older brothers or sisters or whatever, um, and they have, they have that kind of, you know, the respect that you've got for someone who's been doing it for ages and, you, and you're literally a few years old, your, your band. Same as, you know, I used to have um, for anyone who'd been at this for a long time, because God knows it's not easy. Mm. Um, yeah, you have that as a, as, a, as a bit more gratitude. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Still just battling through the day to get to bedtime and, um, you know, I mean, it's, 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 that, that, that cheapens the whole experience, actually. I'll, I'll, I'll take that back. It's, being on stage is a lot different because it's not about me anymore. And, and sometimes you can't help but get trapped in your own head. But for the most part, you're out there in a position of, uh, of, of, of gratitude and of service, of like, you know, you're still here, you're still coming to see us. You're still being battered around in that, bunch of people at this on this in the front of the stage and you know we still played too loud you know it didn't yeah. get more sedate as we got as everyone got older um and it's it for that for that 90 minute portion of the day it really does feel like things are, are lighter you know mm. things are more manageable you know all them people that have obviously put a little bit of weight on in the crowd suddenly they they're young again. They're, they're weightless. They're, you know, the whole thing just, the whole thing makes something that I think, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more thankful for now than I was mm. when it just felt like us, us versus them. Now there isn't a them, you know, mm. like, I don't know, I think someone accused it of, of napalm death of being, you know, you're not fighting the establishment, you are the establishment. And I guess we are. We all are the establishment now, and that's a pretty good feeling, you know. Mm. I'm still pissed off. I'm still, you know, don't know what to do with me anger a lot of the time, but um, that's probably a good thing, you know. So the songs don't all turn into saccharine yeah. shite. Yeah, no, they certainly haven't. I mean, do you, do you find now that you understand yourself a lot more, and is that through the music, oh. or is or is it actually just that's never going to happen? Is it just got even more, com it's more complex and more... It's worse. It's worse because it didn't get better. <laughs> it just get, keeps getting fucking weirder and weirder, you know. And yeah, then no, the I, trick is just yeah. to hold on and just, you know, get get to the punchline. <laughs> but I know this is only a Zoom interview, but you seem in a very good place. You seem very upbeat. You feel... Yeah. Just... I've, had, I've had me... I've had me Pot of coffee, which is really strong today, because I've got I've got terrible insomnia. I've been out on my three hour walk with my dog. Um, so yeah, it's it's up until lunchtime, things are always good. It's evenings when things get bad. It's evenings when the horns come out and it gets dark and you go like, you know what? I could probably I could probably score some drugs and have them have them back here in ten minutes. Mm. Um, and that's when it it turns into a a, a, a fight with yourself to not yeah it's, it's, it's time to get the guitar out time to look at the dog's face <laughs> yeah yeah all those tricks all those yeah. tricks and it works you know and even if you're fighting yourself and fighting yourself you wake up in the morning you go like yes mm. you know mm. still wake up in the morning and go did it mm. you know not yeah. always successfully but you still wake up in the morning and go come on let's go for a really long walk and yeah is that is that the biggest thing you learn? I think in life that the little things are actually the biggest things, aren't they? Take your dog for a walk is a better high than fucking your head up the night before, isn't it? God, yeah. Which yeah, when you're twenty would just seem like a complete joke, wouldn't it? But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I used to hate people like me when I was younger, you know, <laughs> extolling the virtues of uh, of coffee and exercise. Um, <laughs> but you know, I've I've 
the, the only thing, the only thing is I've, 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 I've got to be careful being around people because I, because I haven't got karma. Mm. I, I, if people drive me fucking mad and I'm going to, you know, I just try to, every time I can get away from being in public without ending up getting in trouble, then, then it's a good day, but it's a, it's a gamble a lot of the time. It's because mm. when I'm these idiots, I've just got this, this ridiculous idea that I should make my displeasure known. <laughs> which, is, which is not very smart, and, and and I have done in the past, and I've got in trouble, and um, you know I've just got had a, a suspended sentence. I've uh, just worked through a suspended sentence, so now I can travel. Now that you can't travel anymore, now, but now <laughs> I, I can technically travel and get visas and stuff. And I still every day go out and just go. Oh. He he would definitely benefit from someone just. Slapping his face, you know, <laughs> whatever it is, shouting at his dog or being mean to his kids or just being a cunt. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, and and then you just at that point you're just like, come on, Maggie, let's get home. We're cutting the walk yeah. short. That's the wisdom in it. The dog. Yeah, yeah. No, the wisdom is knowing that you're not going to get away with it. You know, yeah, they are <laughs> going to phone the police. You are going to get fucked. And you know, chances are you. You know, I, I was I, I was really scared earlier this year or last year um, that I got in trouble while I was on a suspended sentence, and I, I was convinced I was going down. And I, well, that's going to be it. My kids are. I'm going to see my kids in a, you know, in jail. Mm. And uh, and I thought, if I just please, 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 if I just stay out of jail, I won't do it again. And every fucking day, the fucking temper just flares up, and you, <laughs> you know, still stupid but yeah i guess there is a certain wisdom at play there that I'm, it's not happening that i'm not getting arrested that i'm not in jail yeah still it just the, the urges aren't going away but you recognize that they're there which is step one in it and step two is working the, the uh you get you know how to get away from that situation in it and step yeah. three going home and writing a song i guess to get it out yeah. yeah yeah well step one step two and step three or just get home close the door <laughs> And just stay in. Take your shoes off so you can't fucking leave. <laughs> Get the guitar, stroke the dog, watch a movie, or talk to someone lovely like yourself. Yeah. Well, that's good. Well, that's a, I guess that's a nice place to end the interview, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah I've, I've enjoyed this, Rod. I've, I've, I've really have um, looked forward to doing one of these with you because uh, oh, I do yeah. love your, your technique and, I've, and I've, I'll watch you interview anyone. So yeah, uh, that's. I, you know, I really like doing it. It's an odd format because you're doing it on Zoom, but actually, it kind of works in an odd, odd kind of way, doesn't it? It's. Uh, well, I'm going to start filming them properly soon. I've got some cameras in Manchester. Someone's got me a space, so uh, people in town, I can't do like proper three camera shoots with and stuff. But, um, nice, nice. I do like them. I do like when you interview people like a rebellion and stuff like that. I do. I do like that. Yeah, I like. I like doing those kind of things. We nearly yeah. did one at Rebellion one year, and they I didn't. Remember, yeah. Have whatever reason. I've never, we never actually interviewed, have we, this, which is odd, isn't it? But I guess no. we're missing each other. We've written about you, of course. And I've seen you've interviewed so many people. Hey? It feels like I've, interv I've been interviewed. I know, because I guess we've played gigs together. We've been on the same bills. We've done, we crisscrossed a lot, haven't we? But we just haven't done the interview thing. Yeah. And I think the first time I saw Wild Arts, I mean, it wasn't the first, but I remember seeing you play with Mannix years ago. Oh God, yeah, yeah. Well, I remember, uh, yeah, it was Manchester. I remember you being there because yeah, I, I was at that. I was at uh, Birmingham. Was at the Birmingham gigs. I was interviewing the Mannix. Because I, I think I'd just been to see Goldblade when we played with the Mannix. Was that is, was that timeline work? Were you guys? I think so. Playing? It, yeah, uh, maybe no. It was before actually before Goldblade. I think um, this is about nineteen ninety or ninety one. I saw you on that Mannix tour. Because they totally loved your bands. They were always going on about Wild Arts. I could have sworn that you were at the Mannix gig after a, a Goldblade gig. Anyway, Goldblade started touring in about 1994. And I think the... Oh, shit. Don't Get Into Souls about... That was a tour I wanted, his second Mannix album. Was that 91? God, it didn't half blur up, didn't it? God, <laughs> guys, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, you know, what, what, at one point, everyone says, like, you're, you're going to write a book. And I'm like, yeah, pr probably. But at the end... Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You, know, with, with you never quite know where the end is, so you may, you may just get on with it. Also, it's, it's quite good to get that stuff written down as well. Everything should be documented. Are you going to write a book? I'm not, I know you've written books. So are you going to write a book about you? Uh, yeah, there's um, 
there's an agent got in touch a couple few months ago. So I'm just I've written a couple of chapters because you have to shop the chapters around to get publishers to buy it. But it's yeah, I'm really enjoying writing it. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I've got a lot of stories. But I mean different from yours, because yours, yours are more rock and roll than mine. But um I've I've certainly seen a lot. <laughs> I would love to read that. I've just, I, I really enjoy reading uh, Alvin Gibbs stories just from the, the, the timeline, like being yeah. there on the front line then. I had his book um, years ago, the one where he toured the Iggy Pop, that one. Um, oh, I love that. Neighbourhood Threat. Yeah, it's a great book. Isn't it? Because fantastic it's, book. It's, Such it's, a great book. It's a bit like Diary of a Rock and Roll Star. It's like when you're a kid, when you read it, it's like, oh, that's a world tour. That's what it's like. That looks like the life, doesn't it? <laughs> oh my god, yeah. That's one of those books I keep coming back to. In fact, when I read his last book, the volume one of his autobiography, I, I had to go back and read Neighborhood Threat again in, in preparation for the, the new one coming. I think I'm doing the foreword to his new book, but I, I, anyway, digressing. Um, I, I would love, love to read your stories. Yeah, love, probably, love probably next year once it's down, but you should do yours because I think one is good to document stuff, but also I think it, it probably help get the pterodactyls out as well. <laughs> so Maybe. It's a Maybe. double edged sword, isn't it? Then you can work oh, well, out why me... you did certain things at certain times. And if you did it very hard on the sleeve, like you are as a person anyway, it will make it a really great read. You know, the warts and all, good bits, bad bits. And don't, don't, I I'll wait until I read yours. Let's hope that yours inspires something in me 